In 2017, I helped stage a coup to take over a men's restroom in the LaGuardia airport. So because this is in 2017, it was at the height of the airport renovations in LaGuardia, if you know, you know, or maybe that's just a New York thing. So I just gotten off a very long flight and I was bursting. I mean, I truly thought that I was going to pee my pants. And it seems that every other person on the plane had that exact same thought because as soon as that plane landed, we all rushed out of the plane to the nearest restroom. So I'm waiting in line at the women's bathroom. And that line is just getting longer and longer. Meanwhile, in the men's bathroom, that line cleared in about five minutes. It was infuriating. So I, along with 10 other women, we said enough is enough. And we took over the men's restroom and we took turns guarding the door for each other while we took care of business. And I know you're dying to know, no, I did not pull my pants. Now, don't worry, the rest of my talk will not be about bathrooms. I'm telling you this story because I'm inviting you to think about why this is the case. I know that every other woman here has had that exact same experience of waiting in line for the bathroom, desperately needing to go, and seeing the men's side be completely empty. We know that women have different needs when it comes to the bathroom, just physically speaking. And yet, despite this, all bathrooms are pretty much designed the same. So yeah, all bathrooms are designed the same, but that doesn't make sense, right? I mean, men and women have different needs when it comes to the restroom. So it turns out that this pattern, right, of ignoring sex differences um, is pretty much seen in a variety of other parts of society. Um, and I'm a neuroscientist by training, and yes, we do this see this exact same pattern of ignoring sex differences and using male as the default in a variety of other in biomedical research. And this isn't a particularly new or novel concept. In fact, there have been a variety of other TED Talks dedicated to, to this exact same concept. All of these talks that I'm showing you are from the 2010s, which at this point is more than a decade ago. But there are serious real world implications to this decision, and it's really affecting women's mental health. Women are more than two times more likely than men to experience depression. And I wanna be careful with this statistic because there are some valid critiques here. So just some people would claim that due to gender differences around reporting, women are more likely to seek help than men, right? Well, not really. This is a global statistic, which means that across different cultural and societal expectations, women are still reporting depression at higher rates than men. And that indicates that there is indeed a biological component contributing to this underlying brain and depression. Next, let's look at the symptomatology of depression, meaning what are the actual medical symptoms experienced by men and women suffering from depression? Women are more likely than men to experience what we call atypical symptoms of depression. So this can include a reduction in energy, changes in sleep-wake cycles, and changes in appetite. Men, on the other hand, are more likely to suffer from symptoms of irritability, uncontrollable rage, and melancholic symptoms. There are specific depressive disorders that really only occur in women, such as premenstrual dysphoric disorder and postpartum depression, and men are more likely to complete suicide than women. And finally, there are different comorbidities associated with depression. For instance, women are more likely to experience comorbid, rate, uh, comorbid depression and anxiety, whereas men are more likely to suffer from comorbid depression and substance abuse. So together, these data indicate that there are indeed sex-specific mechanisms underlying depression. And if we can identify, study, and target those mechanisms, then we could potentially develop treatments that work better for women. So this kind of leads to the logical next question, which is, but why? Don't we already have treatments for depression? And don't they already work for women? And to that, I would say that's absolutely correct. We do have a lot of antidepressant drugs on the market drugs such as Prozac, Lexapro, and Zoloft. And for many patients, broadly speaking, these antidepressant drugs are safe and effective. However, they were all developed primarily in male research models. And as a result, there are real world implications for this. For instance, women are more likely to suffer from adverse side effects of these antidepressant drugs. And furthermore, 
antidepressant use is reported to decline during and after menopause, which means that there's an entire population of older women who are not benefiting from the antidepressant actions of these drugs. So, okay, we know that this is a problem, right? But what if we could develop treatments that were more effective for women? Where would we start? Well, if you're me, you start with the one, the only, the all-powerful lab mouse. Now, these cute little creatures have a variety of different behaviors that we can take advantage of um, to measure fear, depressive-like, and anxiety-like behavior. And we do it this way with a battery of different behavioral tests because depression is what we call a heterogeneous disorder, which means that people who suffer from depression suffer from a constellation of different symptoms. And we also do it this way with these behavioral tests because sure, we can send a man to the moon, we have self-driving cars and we can use AI to write computer code, but we still can't sit down and ask a mouse what it's thinking and feeling. Well, we could, but they would only speak in reply. So one test that we use is called fear conditioning and this measures fear. So we place the mouse into a box and we give the mouse a series of mild electrical foot shafts. And then later we can place that mouse back into that same context and we can measure fear by how much the mouse freezes. What about depressive life behavior? Well, for this, what we do is we measure what's called behavioral despair. So we place the mice into a bucket of warm water for a very short period of time. And then we measure how much that mouse swims and struggles to escape compared to how much the mouse just gives up and floats. So the more the mouse floats, the higher the depressive life behavior. And then finally, for anxiety-like behavior, we use a test called novelty suppressed feeding. So for this test, we place a hungry mouse into a brightly lit box that it's never been before. And then we place a single pellet of food right in the center of that box. And so the mouse has to overcome its anxiety of this novel environment in order to approach the pellet and to feed. So the higher the latency to feed, the higher the anxiety-like behavior. So using these different behavioral tests, we tested a variety of different drugs, some of which were already known to be antidepressant treatments. And we found that a number of these drugs were actually really, really good at combating these types of behaviors in male mice. They were not as effective in females. So let me give you an example. You probably are familiar with ketamine in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you were given ketamine in a hospital setting for pain management or for anesthesia purposes. Maybe you took ketamine in a club setting to get high. No judgment, you do you. Ketamine has received a lot of attention in recent years because it's the newest antidepressant that we have developed to combat depression. But again, despite this relative newness, ketamine was developed primarily in male research subjects. And so when we tested ketamine in our own mouse model, what we saw is that ketamine was great at reducing fear and also depressive-like behavior in male mice. However, in the females, it was a completely different story. So you can see here that ketamine did nothing to combat fear behavior in the females. And it did reduce depressive-like behavior in the females, but not as drastically as it did in the male mice. And so this aligns with anecdotal evidence in humans suggesting that ketamine does act as an antidepressant in both sexes, however, its antidepressant efficacy is more variable in women. So then we went a little bit further and we decided to ask, okay, is ketamine actually working in older menopausal women? And so we can mimic this in our mouse model by administering a surgical procedure to remove the ovaries of a mouse. And what that does is that results in a reduction in estrogen and progesterone that's similar to the reduction in hormones that's seen during menopause. So in our intact mice, meaning mice that still had their ovaries and therefore high levels of hormones, ketamine did reduce depressive like behavior, just like we saw previously. But in mice that did not have their ovaries, therefore low levels of hormones, ketamine antidepressant efficacy was ablated. And so again, this aligns with clinical evidence that ketamine is not effective as an antidepressant in older patients, particularly in older women. Okay, so this is sounding a little bit bleak, but I'm up here giving a TED talk. So clearly there was some positive impact or something positive that we found in our studies. And there was actually one drug that we tested 
that was really, really effective in the female mice. And I'll admit, initially we dismissed this drug, mostly because that when we administered it in the male mice, what we saw was that it wasn't really effective. So levels of fear, depressive-like, and anxiety-like behavior were comparable in the male mice compared to saline controls. However, when we administered this drug, Bay 55 for female mice, it reduced fear, it also reduced depressive-like behavior, and it reduced anxiety-like behavior. This is huge, by the way, and I really want to take time to impress this upon you. We had never before seen a drug that could act like this, where it had absolutely no effect in the male mice, and yet it was doing so much to reverse all of these different behaviors in the female mice. But let's go a little bit further than that. Remember how I told you that women are more likely than men to suffer from changes in sleep-wake cycles during depression? Well, we can actually model that. And we use these specialized boxes that use temperature and activity levels to infer sleep-wake cycles. So this is a picture of those exact same boxes that we have in the lab. You can see the mice have food, water, bedding, pretty much everything in this need. And underneath that bedding is a little grid of sensors that tracks temperature and activity levels, just like I stated previously. So when we ran this experiment, we had two questions. First of all, does exposure to stress result in changes in sleep-wake cycles in the females? And secondly, if we administer Bay 55, does that reverse those stress-induced impairment in sleep-wake cycles? So let's look at our non-stressed mice. So these mice, what we did was we placed them in our conditioning boxes and we did not administer any foot shocks. And so as we would expect, fear behavior is very low. And then similarly, when we look at the amplitude of the sleep-wake cycle, so this is just that difference in activity levels between the sleep and the wake states, it was pretty much the same between the two. And so this is great news. What this means is that Bay 55 does not alter baseline behavior in female mice. So it's less likely to result in adverse side effects later on. When we stress the mice, meaning we gave them those foot shocks, as we would expect, fear behavior increases. But what we also saw is that the amplitude of their sleep-wake cycles decreased. So you can almost think of it like the exposure to the stress placed the mice in almost a constant state of vigilance that impaired their sleep-wake cycles. Now, when we administer Bay 55, what you can see is that that does decrease their fear behavior, but it also restores the amplitude of their sleep-wake cycles back to non-stress controls. And so these data show that we have a proof of concept candidate molecule that we can place in further development as a female specific antidepressant drug. And furthermore, what's really special about Bay55 is that it works on a receptor called the VPAC2 receptor that's never previously been studied within the context of stress and depression. So this gives us, in addition to being a female specific antidepressant, potentially, this also opens up a new field of study where we can investigate the upstream and the downstream effects of the VPAC2 receptor in order to investigate female-specific mechanisms underlying depression. Now, I don't wanna oversell this. There's still so much left that we have to do to make sure that this drug is A, safe without any adverse side effects, and B, actually effective in treating depression. And that's actually a gargantuan task. I mean, I could have a whole other TED Talk right now just on that challenge alone of translating drugs from mice to humans. Don't worry, I won't. Uh, but my main point right here is that we have proof that a female-specific antidepressant is possible. We know that it exists. And with a little more work, we can turn that drug into a reality, taking into account at every step what women need from their antidepressant. Now, it's kind of inevitable that every time someone stands up and says, we have this product for women, someone else is going to stand up and say, well, what about the men? And to that hypothetical someone, I would say, first off, that's pretty much every other drug that we've developed. And secondly, I would say to that hypothetical someone that developing female-specific medications is actually better for all of society. Because in the process of developing and investigating those drugs, well, we actually gain a lot of knowledge and nuance about how sex interacts with disease mechanisms to influence how a disorder manifests, both biologically and behaviorally. And we also gain a lot of insight into what types of treatments 
might be better for certain demographics of the population. And isn't that better for everyone? Now, I'm a neuroscientist by training, so my focus is very brain-centric. But I think that this concept could be really powerful if we applied it to other parts of medicine. Women have been historically excluded from biomedical research, and that's resulted in negative real-world implications for a variety of other medical fields, not just psychiatry. If we can be more inclusive of women in the scientific process, all the way from the doctors and the scientists to the research subjects themselves, then we can really improve the consistency, the rigor, and the reproducibility of our research. I see my own research as part of a new wave of science aiming to investigate and address the sex-specific disparities with the ultimate goal of shifting our approach towards a more widespread model of personalized medicine. Because ultimately, better science for anyone is better science for everyone. Thank you.